Before we jump into the Word of God this evening, will you bow with me for a word of prayer? Holy, gracious, and almighty God, we come before you this evening in a calm and quiet moment. We come before you this evening to listen, to hear a word of hope, to make a commitment throughout these 40 days to grow closer to you. Lord, we live in a world of chaos. So may the calm, quiet of this moment restore our souls. Holy God, we come to you this evening seeking your presence. Be here, O Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Ash Wednesday marks the beginning of Lent, and Lent is one of my favorite seasons in the church. Tonight is one of my favorite worship services. Lent as a season is the oldest season in the church. When the church first was getting organized, they started to create seasons, and Lent was the first one. It was the only one they had, a time of preparation leading up to the celebration of Easter and the resurrection of Christ. It has so much history that goes along with it. Lent is about preparation, remembrance, and repentance. It's about telling and retelling and participating in the story of Christ. It's about reflecting on our lives, taking up spiritual practices to help us grow closer to God as we prepare to celebrate and remember the death and resurrection of Christ in six weeks. Lent is 40 days. It doesn't count Sundays. Sundays are meant to be little mini moments of resurrection where we celebrate and we break from our fast. It's 40 days, six days a week with Sabbaths in between leading up to Easter, a time of preparation. Lent is 40 days long because it represents the 40 days that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. We find these in the gospel narratives very early in his ministry. He is driven out into the wilderness and he is tempted by the devil. The tradition of ashes that we get this evening goes back to the ancient Hebrew people When they were mourning, they would put on sackcloth and ashes. It was a symbol of humility. It was a symbol of repentance. They would sprinkle ashes on their heads when they were in mourning to show a sign of grief and during prayers. You can see some of this throughout Scripture. In Daniel 9, it says this, Then I turned to the Lord God to seek an answer by prayer and supplication with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and made confession. We also see this in the creation story right afterwards, right in Genesis 3, after the earth has been created. God says, By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. That's where we get that old phrase, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We came from the ground. In Genesis, it says that God scooped up some dirt, formed a human, and breathed life, breathed the Spirit of God into us. We are made from simple, common things and made holy by God, who breathes life into us. We see this time of Lent as this chance to take away some of the busyness and trappings to kind of get back to these ancient rituals. It's one of, the, one of my favorite things about this evening is I get to wear this fancy get-up. Um, this is called an alb. Um, if you go to any United Methodist churches more in the northern part of the United States, you'll see that this is basically all they wear. It comes from the ascetic monk tradition. If I look like a monk tonight, that's why. Um, that's where it comes from. And it's this idea of simplicity. The robes that we traditionally wear, the black robes that you see Emma and Courtney wearing, come more from academia when the church started to become more of an institution of teaching and learning to help people understand who God was. And so you see that reflected in two different ways, that the church is meant to be a place where we learn and grow closer to God, but also a place of humility where we try to humble ourselves before God. And so it's one of my favorite things that I get to wear all this fancy get-up tonight. When you come forward this evening, um, one of the things that Courtney and I will say is repent and believe in the gospel. And that comes from the first chapter of Mark. John the Baptist is there to announce the coming of Jesus Christ. That's his job. He's the messenger. He is sent before to let everyone know that Jesus is on his way. 
And he urges people to repent and believe in the gospel. And that's what Lent is all about. A season of preparation, taking John the Baptist's words to heart and answering that call ourselves. We talk a lot about repentance on a night like tonight and during Lent, and repentance is a word that sort of has a mixed bag of emotions that goes with it. A lot of times we hear the word repentance and we think guilt, sin, shame, that to repent somehow means like we are coming before an authority or coming before a parent to be scolded because we broke the rules and we have to go pick a switch, metaphorically. Repentance has this sort of guilt and shame layer to it. That's not really what that word means or where it comes from. Repentance means to turn to God, to repent, to turn towards God. It also has some roots from the time during exile when the Hebrew people were lost in Babylon. They repented and they came home. It's a way of returning to God. So to repent is not to feel guilty and ashamed of anything you may have done wrong. Repentance is about turning away from those things that distract us and pull us away from God and returning home from that exile. It's a wonderful moment when you turn and come home. And that's what Lent is all about. It's not about feeling guilty. It's about moving forward into an intentional time with God. I just got out of a very intentional time in my own life, not with God, but with my children. Uh, today is the first day that I am back to work after being on paternity leave since the beginning of the year. Um, it is very wonderful to see adults um, in this space. It is wonderful to have conversations uh, that are about more than what type of block are we going to be playing with as we move throughout our day. Um, I basically spent all day, every day, this decade, I get to say that because it's 2020, with our two boys, Henry and Simon. Um, when I went on opportunity to leave with our first son, Henry, about three years ago, um, everything was about Henry, and it was so easy because he was the new thing. It was just one kid, and it felt unbelievably overwhelming. I didn't know what I was doing. I was terrified I was going to, you know, this kid was going to die or escape, even though he couldn't move. I was like watching him at all times. And everything was all about Henry. And then Simon came along, and now we have two kids. And I learned that the first paternity leave, everything was about Henry. And the second paternity leave, everything is about Henry. (laughs) Because Henry turns three next week on Tuesday. Three years old. Three years old. Three-year-olds are crazy. <laughs> he's not even three yet, um, but he is, uh, he's batting above his weight, yeah. Uh, he, is, he, is, uh, he is bringing me closer to Jesus. Um, and so I've spent eight weeks with these two beautiful, wonderful children, and I survived. And as I think about this story tonight, Jesus in the wilderness, when I think about this season of Lent, you know, I don't know what it was like for Jesus to be in the wilderness tempted by the devil for 40 days, but I was stuck in a single house for 56 days with a toddler and an infant, so I feel like for the first time in my life, I have a deeper connection to maybe some of the emotions Christ was going through. A couple days ago, I was nearing the end, and I thought, you know, if I were Jesus, at this point, I think I'd be calling the angels. I don't know if I'd have the energy. But we see Jesus run that test of time. I make a lot of jokes about my paternity leave because it was so wonderful and I'm now thankful it's over to return back to work. Um, But it was a really wonderful time. I got to spend this incredible and valuable time with my boys, especially with new Simon. Um, He's little and he's cute and he's quiet and he sleeps and he's beautiful and he's everything a baby should be. Um, He is our reward after Henry, uh, who really tried every fiber we had in our body um, when he was that age. And so it has been wonderful to spend this time with those boys. Um, I was reminded while I was on leave how incredible stay-at-home parents are. It's easy to sort of take that for granted. And when I hadn't been on leave in a long time or before I ever had kids, I used to look at stay-at-home parents and say, what a great setup. You just stay home all day. You just wear, pan- you wear pajamas all day. You just eat pancakes all day. This is, this, is the, this is the life. It is not for me. It is not for me. I was not wired that way. I love my kids so dearly. But those days get long. And you come to the end of your work day, When your spouse comes home and your work is over and now it's the evening time and now you go from being a parent all day long to being a parent all evening long. And then you wake up and they're still there. (laughs) 
stay-at-home parents have this endurance, this strength that I always forget about until moments like this. It's lonely. It's isolating. Kids can be mean. There were some moments near the end of my leave when I was just being screamed at for three hours and I would snap back and I would yell at Henry because I just couldn't take it anymore. Three hours of screaming and now Simon's crying because Henry woke him up and my mind feels like it's gonna explode like there's rats clawing at me and so I lashed out at Henry in a moment of anger and yelled at him and I scared him. And there are very few moments of instant regret and shame and heartache than when you scare your child. Which just makes leave so much better to enjoy. So I was reminded of the incredible work that stay-at-home parents and grandparents and guardians who do full-time child care, how much love and how much strength they have and how much courage to choose that. One of the best parts about my leave is that it broke my regular routine. It just changed my weekly schedule up. I am an early bird. Uh, I was not for a long time, uh, but about 10 years ago, I started to realize that the morning is the Lord's time, and I love it. And so normally, I wake up about 4 or 5 in the morning, and I do a bunch of work, and kids get up, and we do our routine, and everyone goes off, and I work, and then I'm you know, there for the evening, go to bed, 9 or 10, um, do it all over again the next day. And when I was on leave, all of our work, you know, was being done. I was not, I was on leave, so I wasn't doing work here for the church, and so I did need to get up early in the morning, and so I'd stay up a little later, Emma and I would watch a TV show, or one of the kids would be up late, or I'd just, you know, get lost watching a Netflix show or something, and so I'd end up staying up till 11 or 12, and I'm not getting up at 4 or 5 then, so I slept until 7 or 8. That sounds silly, but even that little change, you start to see different things when your rhythm is disrupted. I stayed in the house. You know that I have filled up my truck with gas. My truck, it's 16 miles to the gallon. It is not fuel efficient. I have filled that sucker up once in 2020. (laughs) Once. If you've wondered where I have been in the last two months, it is in one location. Or, or, Or I'm driving to take Henry to school. Broke up my routine. And I started to notice different things when that happened. Because I wasn't going about my regular life. So I started to notice little things. Some good, some not great. When you're in your house, you sort of, you know, your mind kind of glosses over the things that you forgot to do two years ago. Uh, But when you're sitting in your house for eight straight weeks and you stare at that thing and you think, man, we painted that wall a year ago and we didn't finish. A year ago. And it made me see things differently. It interrupted my routine. And that's what Lynn is supposed to do for us. It's supposed to shake up our routine. It's supposed to get us to try something different for an amount of time, not just for a day, not just once, but for 40 days. To interrupt your routine, to try something new so that you might see things a little differently. So you may see something maybe you took for granted, maybe something you didn't see before because you were so busy. God surprises us when we make space, and that's what Lent is all about, interrupting our routine. Lent is meant to be a time when we stop moving so fast. Look Jesus in the eye. Look Jesus in the eye and try to answer the same question that he asked the disciples when they were in Caesarea Philippi. In the middle of the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is as far away from Jerusalem as he ever is, as far away from his home in Galilee as he ever goes, and he gathers his best friends together and he asks them a question. He says, what's the word around town? What do people say about me? And they give him some answers, and he looks him in the eye and he says, But you, Andrew, but you, Gail, but you, Chris, who do you say I am? That's a different question. It's easy to say what people think, but when someone looks you dead in the eye and says, who am I to you? A lot of us know what this is like because we had a significant other ask us at one point in our life. That's a conversation everyone loves. Sitting down to dinner and you get through the appetizers and they look over at you and say, you know, we've been dating for a few months and I'm just curious, you know, uh, where are we? What a fun conversation. That's what God asks these guys. Jesus Christ looks them in the eye and says, who am I to you? You've been walking with me for a while and who am I to you? It's a personal question. 
and it's scary. And that's what Lent is all about, trying to answer that question, who is God to you? And so I want you to think for a second about your life. If you want to close your eyes or stare off into space or stare right at me, whatever helps you communicate, whatever helps you concentrate, there you go. I want you to think about your life. Not your calendar, not your schedule, but your soul. How is it with your soul tonight? How is it with your soul? Your soul tonight. I know that there's a lot of pain in this room. Some of you are so tired you can't even see straight. I know what that's like. Some of you are so lonely, you cried about it today. Some of you don't want to go home tonight because of broken or strained relationships. Some of you are sitting in this room wondering if God is even real. And friends, I've been in all of those places. I've been in some of those places recently. I want you to know something tonight. I want you to look at me. Every single person in this room is a child of God and a blessing. Every single person in this room is a child of God and a blessing. Every single person in this room is called to do great and mighty things. And when we hear that, a lot of us do exactly what Moses did. You're not talking about me, right? I mean, you're talking about that other person who always, you know, sings in church and, you know, gets up and does other things. You're not talking about me. I don't even know if you're real. You. That's what Jesus does with his disciples. He looks at each and every one of them and says, you. I'm calling you, Andrew. I'm calling you, Simon. I'm calling you, Judas. I'm calling you. Every person in this room has sacred worth. And none of you are alone. None of you are alone. Friends, tonight we do a holy thing, a sacred thing. Tonight we look Jesus in the eye. Tonight we are marked with the ashes of repentance and forgiveness. Tonight we begin a journey with Christ. Tonight we start to heal the pain in our lives. And tonight we stand in the presence of of God. Let us begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.